Hello, I am Dr. Hisham Chalepi from Wake Forest University. I am the director of ultrasound and I'm going to be talking to you about color Doppler application in the abdomen. All right, uh, this is a keyword uh, before we start uh, this lecture, so to be familiar with, I would like you to get familiar with the CDS, it stands for Color Doppler Sonography, the CCTA, Color Comet Tail Artifact, the others are uh, self-explanatory and that should be easy for you to understand that. So let's move on to the next slide. Now, why do we need Color Doppler? This is a question we all ask ourselves about, basically to identify the direction of flow. To help us identify abnormalities not anticipated by the use of grayscale imaging and also to aid us in our decision-making strategies when procedures like biopsies or drainages are requested by clinicians. The other important point is you need to prevent disastrous outcomes when abnormal vascular structures are mistaken for abscesses or other masses. Colored Doppler sonography must be included with all of your abdominal imaging studies. So this is a slide showing the flow direction that we appreciate on an image. We see the grayscale in the background. We, give, we see the overlay of the color Doppler. And we can see in the bottom of the slide the spectral wave Doppler. So we have the combination of all three in the same view or the same image. Now, what color Doppler implies? You have your color saturations. You have your color maps. You have the velocity and the Doppler shift. We're not going to get into details into the physics of their concepts, but the understanding of the basic principles is important for the purposes of this lecture. Now, color Doppler versus spectral Doppler. When you look at spectral Doppler, it's a small region sampled many times. We're using about 30 to 256 samples per display line. Versus color Doppler, where you're using fewer samples, 816 per display line, and mean frequency shift display. Now, Based on what we're getting, we're trying to get something called the Doppler shift, which is the frequency shift. This, is, this phenomenon is observed when sound is reflected from a moving target. Now, the next slide is, we are going to discuss the factor influencing Doppler shift. These are very important factors that you need to consider while you are optimizing your color Doppler. The first one is frequency of the sound used. The other one is the angle of the scan, and the last one is the velocity of flowing blood, the RBCs. Now, frequency, what are you going to use? You're going to use high, or you're going to use low. The concept is you need to understand the advantages of each of the two. Now, higher frequency results in a greater frequency shifts. It's a more robust flow imaging. But remember, you can't use higher frequency all the time because you're limited by the sound attenuation that will affect the penetration. Now we have two examples. We have one slide on the right side. We have another slide on the left side of the screen. And watch, at 7 megahertz, I'm scanning this mass in the liver. And you can see the bulk of the vascularity identified is in the superficial component of the mass. Now the same patient, same plane, I'm using a lower frequency, 4 megahertz probe, and you can see that I see more color Doppler in the center of the mass and in the deepest components of the mass. The other component that is important to us is the angle, the effects of the change in the angles or the angle of incination. So lower scan angle will give you the best or the highest Doppler shift. The optimal angle is zero degree. And the lower the angle, the better the signal. And the higher the angle, the less or worse the signal. Now remember, at 90 degrees, you're not going to get any signal or Doppler shift. Now if you look at this slide, you can see the hepatic veins nicely identified by colored Doppler, particularly the middle and the left. And if you look at the right hepatic vein, you would see there's no blood flow. So you don't want to jump to the conclusion that there is a clot in this vein. First, you need to think, I need to change my angle to be able to say whether there is a clot or not. So we go ahead on the next slide. We change our acoustic window. And as you can see, we can see a very nice 
right hepatic vein filling with color and there is no evidence of clot or any abnormality in this vein. Now we move to velocity measurements. Higher frequency shift will correlate with faster blood flow velocity. It's good at showing relative velocities within a given field of view. But you have to keep in mind, it is not a good measure of the actual velocity. Again, using color Doppler, you may get confused about some patterns of blood flow. The reason why is that is because we're limited by the construction of the probe, by the curvature of the probe itself and design. So the angle of flow is going to vary across the image. The color images or changes with angle to flow will give you different blood flow. Look at this example. The splenic vein is coming all the way to the level of the pancreas. And you can see at the midline of the transducer, the flow pattern changes from going towards the probe to going away from the probe. This is normal accepted variation, and you have to be familiar with that. Now we get to the most important element of this talk is how we get the best of our color Doppler on any machine. So in other words, we need to optimize our color Doppler. Achieving the best color Doppler image is synonymous with tuning a musical instrument. You need to tune the instrument to enjoy the sound produced by that instrument. If you do it right, you will get the information you need and help solve problems. On the other hand, if you don't do it right, you will get confused, you may make erroneous diagnosis or maybe or may miss an important one. So optimizing a color Doppler starts with an initial setup. The first, you're going to look at parameters and how we're going to adjust them. All these parameters exist on all machines on the market today. So the first parameter is acoustic axis. All right, this is the easiest way to do. Just if you can't see what you're looking for, change the area from which you're accessing the organ of interest and you can improve that by optimizing the image, the color flow in the image. The other thing is frequency. As we said, choose high versus low based on what you're looking at. Closer to the surface, deeper to the surface, and also consider the limitations of how far the organ of interest is far from the surface. Next parameter is scan angle. Make sure you have the lowest angle possible to achieve the best results. The next parameter is color gain. Set this at the noise floor level. The focal zone depth, the area of interest. Make sure your focal zone depth are always at the same level of the area or the structure of interest that you need to identify or interrogate with color Doppler. Power output, the maximum allowable by the machine that you can get. Now, beyond that initial step, you need to go and fine-tune your machine, fine-tune your color Doppler settings. This starts with the wall filter adjustments decrease so that you can allow more RBCs or uh, red blood cells to come through the system to be sampled. The scale, decrease the scale, you will get more blood flow or more color signal. The color priority, this thing is uh, very tough to uh, tell you how to optimize, but the thing is many of the machines nowadays uh, are like built-in uh, modality that you cannot change much, and it is part of the manufacturer's preset uh, parameters. The sample volume size, increase the volumes, increasing the volume size also helps you to get better flow in the area of interest. The color box width, Decrease the color bo bo box width. This helps you to get the best out of what you're looking at. Specifically, it will improve your frame rate. Frame averaging, increase frame averaging. Again, adjust accordingly. Make sure you don't have any color bleed and make sure that the vessel of interest that you want to interrogate is filled with color confined to its lumen. Now, Color Doppler has artifacts like any other imaging modality. Sometimes it can be good to have these artifacts, and one of those good artifacts, in my opinion, is color aliasing. 
But aliasing is the result of inadequate sampling resulting from wrap around displays. But remember, ambiguous displays on the image may lead to confusion. Now, how does aliasing help, help us? It helps us to identify specific areas and structures in the abdomen. It can help us distinguish between arteries and vein. We can also benefit from the artifact by producing other artifacts that can help us in our interrogation of the organ or pathology in interest. Now look at this image. You have a colored Doppler image. You look at the portal vein. You see the portal vein going in the right flow, in the right direction. It's hepatopetal. But if you look at the, this part of the end of the vein, where the arrow is showing, you see some color map change. This indicates color aliasing. This color aliasing is not coming from flow within the portal vein. It's actually coming from a flow within the nearby hepatic artery. So this aliasing helps you distinguish between what is a vein and what is an artery, which is a good sign or a helpful tool without even interrogating the structure with specular wave Doppler. Now we move to talk about power Doppler. Power Doppler also is available to us on all high-end equipment. It helps us to add to what we see with color Doppler. Power Doppler has advantages. It is less angle dependent. It does not suffer from aliasing, just like color Doppler. Unfortunately, it also suffers from some limitations, like you can't get information about direction of flow, you can't get much information about velocity, but it also helps us because it has a better signal to noise ratio. You can also scan at a higher gain without distorting the image. Let's look at this example of this case. This patient had a kidney transplant. Earlier during the day had a kidney biopsy and the clinicians wants us to evaluate for left lower quadrant pain. As you can see, you can see the kidney nicely, but you cannot really appreciate what's really exactly going around this kidney. So there's a concern for hematoma in this instance. So power Doppler comes to our help. We do the power Doppler and you can see how the kidney is nicely outlined with power Doppler and you can see the surrounding hematoma without much of a mass effect on the kidney. Now let's look, let's talk about color Doppler advantages in general, including power Doppler. It will definitely make your exams faster. It will help you to establish a new diagnosis. It will add value to your practice. This value can be in areas like tumor resectability, liver and the pancreas, vascular injury, malformations, clots, transplants, portal hypertension, and many other areas. And the bottom line, you can get a greater diagnostic confidence, which is the most important feature why color Doppler is important when imaging the abdomen. Now, when we look at color Doppler, when we do color Doppler in the abdomen, what are the must-to-have images using color Doppler? You need to do the portal veins, splenic vein, evaluate the splenic vein direction and the level of the hilus, also at the level of the pancreas, Look at the hepatic veins with the IVC. The hepatic artery is really not important as much as the portal venous system or hepatic veins. However, this, important, this becomes important when you look at liver transplants because that's the most important vessel you need to interrogate to evaluate a transplant for rejection or possible thrombosis. We also look at the SMA and the SMV and the celiac axis. Looking at these vessels helps us many times to localize the pancreas. When we're looking at the pancreas, it helps us identify the pancreas and may also help us localize lesions in the pancreas better than when looking at the pancreas with a gray scale alone. The both kidneys, we look at the kidneys with colored and power Doppler, but any attempts to interrogate resistive indices or attempt to measure these resistive indices is going to create a problem because you're going to get yourself into a dilemma. What if they are elevated? What are you going to do next? Are you going to switch to evaluate the aorta, the renal arteries, unless there is concern for 
renovascular hypertension, we do not attempt to do resistive indices. The abdominal aorta is also, you need to look at that so that you won't miss any potential silent aneurysms, specifically in elderly patients. Now, as you look at this slide, there are too many applications where you can use color Doppler in the, ab in the abdomen, ranging from portal hypertension to vascular myformations. Even you can use it, not for purposes of evaluating blood flow, but to help you distinguish between what is bile duct and what is a vessel in the liver. Let's have a look, uh, let's have an example, portal hypertension. This is a very important topic, because whenever you evaluate, when you scan the liver, you have too many things you need to keep in mind. There's a large population of patients that having a chronic liver disease and maybe cirrhosis. So these things you need to look at. You look at the pattern of the blood flow in the portal vein, check if it's biphasic or reversed. Now check if there's evidence of portal venous aneurysms, thrombosis. Make sure you'll be able to distinguish between a bland thrombus versus a tumor thrombus. Look for signs of portal hypertension, like reconalized parambilical vein, venous collaterals. Now remember, if you want to do this, it's a good thing to perform this using a cine loop function, or you need to confirm with spectral Doppler the change in flow. If you interpret your imaging just using static images. Let's look at this example. This video clip demonstrates biphasic blood flow in the portal vein. This indicates that there is presence of portal hypertension. This patient is cirrhotic. The reason also is to focus. There's another reason you need to focus on this slide, is you look at the nearby arteries. Look at these arteries. The arteries are big, and they're demonstrating color aliasing, an artifact that you can use to your advantage. Another example in this patient, we see complete reversal of the portal vein and we can see that artery is coursing nearby and showing color aliasing. Another example of a patient with portal venous aneurysm. You can see the gray scale, and you can see on the color Doppler mixing of the signal within the dilated component of the aneurysm, and this is known complication of long-standing portal hypertension. The next thing you need to do about these patients with advanced cirrhosis is they can come down with uh, blood clots in the portal system. If you look at this example on the right upper corner of the slide, you can see on this gray scale without color Doppler that there's an echogenic material within this portal vein. So this indicates a thrombosis. Now notice that the portal vein is not expanding, so this most likely indicates we are dealing with a bland thrombus in this patient. Now let's compare the slide to the other slide in the lower bottom here. In the bottom right corner of this slide, you can see the portal vein is coming into the liver. It's very expanded. You can barely distinguish it from the nearby liver parenchyma, but you notice that there is an arterial signal within that clot. This raises the suspicion for a tumor thrombus. And in any cirrhotic patient with a tumor thrombus, you need to always think about the presence of hepatocellular carcinoma in these patients. This is an example of an enlarged parambilical vein that extends all the way to the surface of the abdomen and goes all the way up north towards the chest. So without color Doppler, you may have a problem identifying that component in the abdominal wall. So color Doppler is important in this instance. Another example of port hypertension. This is an example of massive subhepatic venous collaterals in this patient with port hypertension and cirrhosis. Now, pitfalls you need to avoid in port hypertension. You need to make sure that is the portal vein partially thrombosed or completely thrombosed. You need to scan with different probes, change the frequency, optimize your color scale, adjust your filter settings and gain. The second point is make sure you don't give a false impression of a portal venous thrombosis in cases where there is sluggish portal venous flow, which is a common finding in many cirrhotic patients. On the other hand, 
be aware of the fact that you can falsely get the fact that the portal vein is patent while it is clotted. The reason behind that is you have too high color sensitivity, too low PRF, low filter settings, and color override will distort your image and make you believe that the vein is patent. The other one, false reversal of the right portal vein flow when sampling the right posterior branch. Be careful about this point because flow in the right posterior branch in normal portal veins will go away from your probe and will be encoded blue. And on the spectral wave Doppler, this thing is going to appear below the baseline. It's an example of a pitfall when evaluating a portal vein in this patient with cirrhosis. At 3 megahertz, you can notice that there's little blood flow going into the portal vein, raising the suspicion for portal vein thrombosis. Switching this Doppler frequency to 2 megahertz, we managed to fill the vein with nice sig color signal, avoiding the diagnosis and false diagnosis of portal vein thrombosis. Another patient with portal hypertension with cirrhosis. If you look at this slide, initially this interrogation was performed with a very high scale demonstrating that there is no evidence of flow in the portal vein. The impression was complete occlusion or thrombosis of the left portal vein. Now, improving the sensitivity, sensitivity of this slide demonstrates that there's a flow in the portal vein, but it's reversed. So this is portal hypertension and not portal vein thrombosis. Another pitfall that can be encountered when you get biphasic flow, you need to make sure that you do not interpret any biphasic flow just based on the pattern you encounter as cirrhosis or portal hypertension secondary to cirrhosis. This is interrogation of the portal vein in a patient who is known to have tricuspid valve regurgitation. So this pattern can also be encountered in patients with right side heart failure and patients with tricuspid valve disease. Also remember that if you, if you identify isolated gastric varices, make sure you don't think of portal hypertension, think of splenic vein thrombosis. The etiologies can be, too, can be many. However, don't jump to the conclusion that this is portal hypertension. And another point that is important is clinicians many times ask you to evaluate the splenic vein for thrombosis. Unfortunately, ultrasound is not a great tool to do that. Why is that? Because you need to interrogate the whole length of the spleen, which is not really accessible with sonography. So presence of, in, of flow in a splenic vein does not exclude a splenic vein thrombosis. And always look for little hints. Look, for the, look at the liver texture and surface. It's nodular, there's cirrhosis. Look for signs of recanalized paraumbilical vein. Check if there is enlarged spleen or not. Another example of portal hypertension. You can see in this patient, when you look at this study, you would say there is a flow going completely hepatopetal in this left portal vein. But if you notice carefully, the enlarged hepatic artery indicate there is some decrease in the portal venous flow going into this liver. And you can see in this tiny anterior branch of the portal vein, there is a reversal. So that tiny reversal indicates that there is element of portal hypertension in this patient. So the complete combined color picture of the main vein and the arteries and looking at the flow in all the branches can help you to establish the right diagnosis and not miss the possibility of reversal of flow as in this instance. Now, vascular complications of acute pancreatitis can be evaluated with color Doppler. 30% is seen without necrosis, 57% with parenchymal necrosis. So the most common veins or vessels involved are the portal vein, the splenic vein. Now remember, you're going to get cavernous transformation of the portal vein as a result of occlusion or thrombosis of the portal vein. The arteries that are involved with acute pancreatitis commonly are the splenic and the gastroduodenal artery. Now, remember, the presence of aneurysms will increase the morbidity and mortality in these patients. So, 
attention must be made to exclude the presence of these vascular complications. This is an example of cavernous transformation of the portal vein in this patient with acute pancreatitis. You can see chaotic vascular structures without, with this organized pattern of, of color indicating tiny little veins as a result of occlusion of the portal vein. This is another example of a patient with acute pancreatitis who has multiple short gastric varices. Look at the liver surface. The liver surface is smooth. There are no signs of cirrhosis. So this is isolated. This is a sign of isolated splenic vein thrombosis. Another example of vascular complications of acute pancreatitis. This patient with acute pancreatitis, as you can see, presents with a large pseudoaneurysm of the GDA partially thrombosed, color Doppler helps us to identify the feeder, and this will eventually end up going to the interventional suite for embolization to treat this complication. Another example of complication of acute pancreatitis. If you look at this grayscale image on the right-hand side, you would see there's nothing or no abnormalities of interest to you, but when you use color Doppler, you can easily identify that this cystic structure here is actually an pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. Color Doppler also can help us to look at tumor vascularity. It can help us to identify, characterize those. But remember, both malignant and benign tumors can have increased vascularity. This is an example of a patient who presented with right upper quadrant pain. Incidentally, we look at this liver and we can see fatty liver. The sonographer convinced me that this is most likely a fatty sparing area in common location anterior to the portal vein bifurcation. As you can see, that's the portal veins here. Then we decided to go and evaluate this with color Doppler and to our surprise, we managed to identify that there is a feeding vessel here in the center coming off the portal vein and feeding this mass. Subsequently, the patient went to MRI, and this has been proven to be a hemangioma. Another example of a mass in the liver. This mass shows spoken and wheel pattern, and this spoken and wheel pattern is typical of focal nodular hyperplasia. A very large patient came for renal ultrasound, and this large patient came with an ultrasound, and incidentally, we identified a hypoechoic mass in the lower pole of the right kidney. And if you see, look at this carefully, you don't see much of an acoustic enhancement behind this mass. So we went and we did power Doppler, and power Doppler identified areas of increased vascularity, and this was subsequently proven to be a renal carcinoma. Another patient who presented for a renal ultrasound, and during the examination. Incidentally, we identify this soft tissue mass in the bladder. We apply color Doppler. It's avidly vascular there. So the patient did not have hematuria. Nonetheless, it, she was taken for cystoscopy and biopsy proven transitional carcinoma that was asymptomatic. As I said earlier, color Doppler can help you in your practice to identify and stage pancreatic cancer. And this is a nice example of a pancreatic cancer encasing the SMA, the celiac axis in this instance, and the SMA. You can see the soft tissue mass surrounding the celiac axis. Another area where resectivity can help is evaluating cholangiocarcinomas. As you know, cholangiocarcinomas are not easy to identify. It's even with CT scan, MRI may have an advantage, but ultrasound can identify the vasculature and its relation to the tumor. Look at the tumor sitting here, and you have more than one sectorial duct dilated, and you can see the relationship of the tumor and the thickened common duct. It's close to the hepatic artery, but most of the time it's not invading the artery. The sign here, the presence of two, more than two sectorial duct indicate that this tumor is not resectable. This is the MRI of the same patient, and you can see the thickened common bile duct indicating the presence of the tumor. Again, you can also look at the aorta and the IVC with color Doppler, which is, should be evaluated properly during your abdominal exam because you can identify pathology that was, is not suspected. 
Now, the most in common indication is you look at the aorta for the presence of triple A or aortic aneurysms. In our practice, we feel that clinicians and vascular surgeons feel happy if we give them information about the perfusion of both kidneys by color Doppler above the level of the aneurysm when we identify it. Now, this is an important way to, important uh, hint here. Whenever you evaluate the aorta, make sure you have the right settings of your scale and frequency. And in this instance, you have a lot of aliasing in this aorta. There is an aneurysm dilatation, but if there is a dissection, you can easily miss that. And you adjust your scale, and that scale can help you confine your color signal to the lumen and you can get rid of the aliasing and if there's any abnormality to the flow or two lumens you should be able to identify that with ease. Another example is the IVC. You can look at the IVC and you can easily be misled sometimes if you start with color Doppler. This is an example where color override can miss the diagnosis of thrombosis. Look at this slide. You see color Doppler nicely filling the lumen here and honestly, if you get this still image by itself, you would easily say everything is fine because you don't see much expansion in the venous lumen. But when you look at the grayscale, the grayscale showed an echogenic material within that IVC, and that is consistent with a clot that you can ev easily miss if you overwrite that clot with color Doppler. Now, other important clinical applications with color Doppler, you can use it for acute polynephritis. You can look for the presence of jets in the bladder. In patients with hydronephrosis, you can distinguish what is biliary duct from hepatic arteries, portal veins. You can use the artifacts, as we mentioned, to your advantage, the CCTA or the twinkling artifact, and also color aliasing. Now, acute polynephritis, the diagnosis can easily be made by urine test. However, many times patients present with flank pain or right upper quadrant pain, and they need to distinguish that from gall, gallbladder disease. So what are the features? You can get a focal or diffuse process, may mimic a mass lesion. Now remember, most of the time it's gonna be hyperechoic area and not hypoechoic area. In other words, it's gonna be a bright area in the kidney affected rather than a dark area and then you can may get some urethelial thickening if there's some hydro, and color Doppler, of course, will demonstrate evidence of devoid signal in that area involved with inflammation and infection. So this is an example of an acute pyonephritis. You look at the kidney. The kidney echogenicity is similar to that of the liver in its most parts, except when you come to this portion in the inner polar to the upper pole of that kidney and makes you worry that there might be evidence of acute pyonephritis. And this is the power Doppler, and you can see the power Doppler is filling nicely the kidney except for this same area, and that's how you make the diagnosis of acute pyonephritis. Color Doppler can help us also evaluate for the presence of jets in the bladder from the ureters. Now, keep in mind the following. If both are absent, there is no clinical significance. When both are present but asymmetrical, it may be significant, but most of the time there may be nothing to go and identify. The most important point here is if one is present and the other one is absent. Now, how much time do you need to wait to establish whether you can see the jets or not? All right, time varies, but sometimes you may have to wait 10 minutes to be able to establish that a jet does not exist or does not present on one or other or the other side. The other thing is, if you don't have a jet on one side, just go and check the kidney and save yourself the time. You may identify the cause behind that absence of the jet. An example is, as in this slide, we see a nice jet coming from one side. There's no jet from the right side. We go on the same right side and we can identify hydronephrosis in the right kidney. So here we managed to identify the reason why we do not have a jet because the kidney is obstructed, there's a blockage, there has to be a reason for the absence of that jet. Biliary dilatation, you can easily apply color Doppler and make sure that any cystic structure that is not filling with color and you know it's anatomic course which is important 
is most likely a bile duct. So in conclusion, we managed to go and cover the color Doppler applications of the abdomen. And we need to keep in mind that always include color Doppler evaluation during your abdominal exams, regardless of the indication. Know and be familiar with the most common pitfalls to avoid them. Spend time optimizing your machine parameter and always think, where do I need to look next? And please never aspirate or drain any lesion anywhere in the abdomen, if, even if you're 100% sure that this thing is non-vascular without applying color Doppler. And thank you for your time and attention.